Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm just gonna allow it one minute for folks to tune in. Hello and welcome to today's public program on Truth and Reconciliation. Artist James Harry discusses his newest project with SOS Children Village VC. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Fauni Barra and I'm the Public Programs and Residency Coordinator at Griffin Art Projects. Joining me today to coordinate the Q&A, we have Griffin Indigenous Curatorial Assistant and Emmett Handley. Conse, hello. Uh, I'm a member of the Métis Nation of BC, and I'm very happy to be here and involved in this talk today. Hey. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that our work takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo Nations, to whom we're deeply grateful. As well, we would like to thank Canadian Heritage, North Vancouver Recreation and Culture for the support of today's event. A note before today's presentation, if you would like to see live captions displayed, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. As well, I'll mention that uh, there will also be a chance at, to, at the end of today's presentation for audience questions. So if at any point throughout the presentation, you have a question for our presenter, feel free to type it on the Q&A dialog box. This time we're trying to uh, also invite folks to unmute themselves. So if you wanna uh, ask your question instead of typing it, you can just raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can do that. Joining us today to present his most recent piece, we have artist James Harry. James Harry was born of Squamish nation and Namkin's descent in 1989. James began carving in early childhood with his father, Paul Acton. He graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Emily Card University of Art and Design in 2014 and completed an internship in the United Kingdom in 2011, where he learned metal casting and taught coast stylish sculpture, painting, and drawing in Scottish communities. Harry's diverse portfolio includes cedar carvings, metal carvings, light installations, and murals. Harry has created prominent large-scale public art pieces across the Lower Mainland for over a decade, including a sculpture at YBR Airport and UBC, and 44 foot totten for the Vancouver School Board, as well as the major project Hamochison for the Cineplex Audion in Park Royale in 2019, and a permanent installation for the Whatcom Community College in uh, 2022. In 2021, Harry was awarded the BC Achievement Award, Fulmer Award in First Nation Art. Harry has been invited to Scotland and Germany and to the permanent buildings in Ottawa to represent Indigenous people of Canada and to address issues related to reconciliation. The Royal Botanical Gardens of Edinburgh brought James to the Commonwealth Games of 2014 to demonstrate the integration of his individual style with traditional coast sellish art practices. James was also commissioned to create the gold, silver, and bronze International Games Medal in 2014. Without further ado, I invite artist James Harry to begin his presentation. Thank you, James. Well, thank you. Um, I guess I'll just share my screen here now. Oh, it says it's disabled. Um, you should be able to do it now. Oh, still saying it. Really? Okay. Okay, just a second. Can you try now? There we go. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today on my talk on truth and reconciliation. Today I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, the importance of Salish art and the integration of Salish art uh, into our society. Um, thinking through the lens of 
not just Indigenous, but more focused on Salish art, uh, coming from my background. Uh, my grandmother is Gwen Harry. She comes from Alert Bay. Uh, and she is, uh, she went to residential school. Um, so it, it was my grandmother and on my dad's side and, and as well as my grandpa, uh, Ernest Harry, uh, who is full Squamish. So he's full Squamish is, and on my grandma's side, I'm Kwakiwak and Kwake youth. Um, so with those uh, kind of backgrounds, um, I, my main focus has really been over the last uh, six years on Salish art. Uh, and, and I really felt that today I would really want to take the opportunity to talk about um, just the, yeah, the real importance of how we can begin to think um, about the artwork that comes from this land. Um, so historically speaking, uh, we didn't have as much uh, representation um, uh, of Salish art, mainly because there, uh, well, there was a number of reasons. Uh, one of them being that we would have we would have sac sacred ceremonial fires where we would actually dance our masks or um, regalia, and we would end up burning them in in honor of our ancestors. So there actually wasn't as much uh, historical evidence of our of our artwork. Um, uh, and for me, kind of wanting to study more Salish forms, I found it very difficult to find any sort of evidence of that around or to study it. Um, I know a lot of my uh, peers that I kind of grew up with, uh, other carvers that I knew could go to the Museum of Anthropology and look at the totem poles there and learn from, from that Northern style, but that wasn't really uh, the style coming from my ancestral roots here in, in, in the lower mainland. So uh, you can imagine it might have been quite frustrating for, well, it's not just me, there's many Salish artists that are have been really struggling to find that identity, uh, that close connection to our ancestral um, design language. So it's really been a journey for not just me, but a, a lot of Indigenous artists, contemporary Indigenous artists, um, trying to find a voice uh, in their work and and how we can, can kind of uh, not just take the old those those old forms but contribute in contemporary ways and meaningful ways that uh, change perspectives and that's sort of what my goal has been uh, ever since um well pretty well my whole life I could say uh, but more more in the professional realm after I graduated from Emily Carr I could really focus focus in on that so maybe just a little bit of background. Uh, more about my um, mentorship training. I, I worked under my dad, Polactin Rickeri, uh pretty well my whole life. He, he's a master carver of the Squamish Nation. Uh, he's taken me around the world doing carvings uh, in the UK, um, as well as around North America, uh, carving uh, either if it was house posts. In the past, it was totem poles, but we haven't been doing that as much anymore uh, for reasons I'll get into later. Um, and, uh, so that's more of my mentorship training was from my dad and being able to carve red, yellow cedar carvings. Um, so after that, uh, mentorship training after high school, I graduated and went to, uh, to, decided to apply to Emily Carr to, um, I guess, further my training and my thinking behind what it is that I wanted to do. Uh, I had the technical skills of carving at that time, but I didn't quite understand where I wanted to go with my work. So I felt that going uh, to that institution would have uh, really helped me with that. Um, so, and uh, yeah, so uh, when I graduated, it was, I started working on this series, uh, Poetry of Language that, uh, kind of deconstructs our forms. It takes our forms, our Salish art, and kind of reimagines re what that what it could look like. So before I get into that, I actually just wanted to maybe give you guys a little bit of um a little bit of a background knowledge behind Salish art. Um, so I've decided to represent two different styles here just because I know a lot of people are more familiar with form line art. Uh, and that's actually what I kind of grew up trying to 
more like create more too because there was just it was everywhere right like like I was saying earlier I went to the Museum of Anthropology and you would see these designs on totem poles and uh side like sides of um buildings it was just everywhere uh very popularized by Bill Reed uh during his era as well as a number of other famous uh northern artists and um so I I, I kind of struggled with that early on so I'm now at a point where I can I understand the two different forms well enough that I I think that you know it's really important for people to kind of understand those differences because it's like comparing uh what's a good example uh Germany to Scotland that's like the difference in the ty types of and how different our um ways of life were so you can see on the left here the Salish forms it's more based in uh so the object that you would be carving would be the positive and the negative is the space that you're carving away so in this area here you can see uh this is a trout head where you it's a use of different forms from the trigon to the crescent and the circle so those are the three main forms that usually depict up any type of composition or animal whatever it is that you're trying to create so you kind of have to think through as if you're piercing through an object rather than painting an object um which is actually quite the opposite in form line where it is you're using your paintbrush to kind of outline a figure um and it's really just built upon uh two to three different forms uh one being the ovoid shape and the u shape and they're just sort of pieced together to kind of make up a puzzle so the more you understand it these you can start to understand the visual language and how things work it's there's really a structure to it all so um with salish art i i find that it actually is quite um complicated sometimes with when you only have three forms to work with uh to kind of create pieces but there are all kinds of ways that you can mani manipulate those forms like with the trigon you can really uh distinguish different curvatures with it um just getting more into the sail of shapes there's very varying shapes from very skinny crescents to medium size to fatter style uh crescents um so there's many ways that you could kind of utilize these different forms around shapes so it's more these they're more used to kind of insinuate a movement or a direction uh, to kind of guide your eye through uh, a work. So there's the crescents here and then the trigons, varying shapes. And then here on the right, there's from the circle to the oval. Um, uh, this uh, little diagram here on the left is by Aaron Nelson Moody, one of my mentors, who we put this together. Uh, if anybody, if there aren't any teachers uh, in this, talk I'd be happy to share this uh with you for, with the permission of Aaron of course uh that I know that there are a lot of teachers that want to use this in their classrooms to educate um kids but this is all in the kind of Coast Salish elements that would be used um to make up these compositions so uh, I just wanted to use here on the right an example of an old spindle whirl that was carved uh, we don't I'm not quite sure of the artist I know that Susan Point uh did kind of did her take on it on the spindle or spindle or here um but you can see those uses of trigons and crescents kind of guiding your eye around this uh sort of circular motion so really it's just the the way i think salish art came to be was that it was rooted in carving so when you look at a lot of these uh design elements here rather than thinking about the space that it's taking up you're thinking about how uh the space you can manipulate the space around it to move your eye through it if that makes any sense um i'll give another example here of an old comb design uh there's uh sort of the the positive space of this outline of this uh wolf um and then slightly like this relief carvings kind of just to kind of bring out the wolf 
And then around here, you can kind of see like it's kind of climbing up this rock face. But again, that use of that, that uh, crescent to the trigon to move your eye through the piece. Um, it was all very kind of fascinating for me to kind of look at these older pieces to see like how our ancestors might have used these shapes um, to kind of create these compositions. And for me in my own art practice, it's been about kind of absorbing all of that information, taking that and think rethinking how we can use these shapes and forms. Um, more specifically for my practice, I was talking about um, poetry of language, how, you know, we didn't have a written language. It was all, um, it was all done through carving. That was our, our language. It was, we would have stories um, of each object uh, and it was all passed down orally. So, you know, there was this like transferring knowledge over the generations through these objects as well. So, uh, and you can imagine the type of different meaning that those objects would take on um, when spoken through the, the, the language. Uh, something that I haven't really had the privilege of being able to uh, grow up with. Uh, one day I hope to be able to speak the language, but uh being that having that connection with with um with with the, those ancient pieces and you know the storytellers that were going along with those pieces you know it wasn't just the combs that were were carved it was house posts that were actual structural um posts for houses as well as the beams the how the post and beam structure so everything sort of had like this um it, there was always, oh, I can't think of the word all of a sudden, but there was always this um, connection that we needed to use our work as a functional object. That's what I was looking for, functional. Uh, there was always a function to everything uh, from the house post to the comb, for example, to the spindle whorl. So thinking through that, I wanted to kind of deconstruct these forms and create my own my own version and, and part of my searching through that has been uh, bringing those shapes that are carved away into the positive and kind of studying the three-dimensional space around it um, and kind of helped me develop a new relationship with these shapes and forms, kind of helped me understand how they might be used um, in various ways. Uh, so more specifically thinking about each shape as something that would take up the space around it and um, making them large in, in, in life comparison so that you would walk around them and the viewer would have a different relationship with all of these um, forms that come out of the land. Because that's sort of my thinking is that all of these forms, like our ancestors were just observers of nature. We looked at uh, the way water moved, the way fire moved, you looked up at the night sky and you saw the moon with the crescents. Uh, it was all kind of relative to that. So those are sort of my theories behind like how our forms came to be. Um, so it's just really an interesting way for me to think through that as sort of this idea where it's like we're rooted in nature, connected to nature, and these artworks are coming out of the land. So the more I, the more I created these pieces, the more I started to kind of develop new relationships with each individual uh, piece. So this one being an extended um, crescent with a trigon. So really it's actually both things are happening here where it's the extended crescent is the positive space and then the trigon is actually being carved into it again. So really that idea that this is all kind of rooted into this like tradition of wood carving. Um, and then thinking about how that relationship might um, look when we bring that into uh, our society, like if these are sculptures or structures that exist or coexist with us in our everyday life, um, that people, as we, as we begin to live with these objects more often, we develop new relationships and understandings about the history and the land that we live on. Um, and that's part of the whole reason I wanted to get into public art is that I, eventually I want to have a lot of these types of works um, uh, coexisting with us in our society so that 
uh, you know, down the road, if we have, even if we have pe people traveling from other parts of the world coming into our, into our city or into, into our country, that they understand that there's this uh, deep connection with the Indigenous people of this land and the land itself. So again, taking that idea a little further, uh, you know, integrating these pieces, how is that, how, getting back to that idea of function, uh, how does, how do these pieces exist in our society when we're looking at these as something that could exist uh, in our surrounding, for, for example, here, a bridge and a bus stop. We're taking these forms that come out of the land, the nature, of those crescents. There's these really beautiful organic forms that as you move them around three-dimensional space, create new shapes and forms uh, from point to point, which uh, I found very interesting when you kind of contrast that into how architecture, like with the surrounding architecture and um, the function of the bus stop, uh, people kind of relating to those shapes again in different ways and some sort of subconscious level, like what is that? What does that mean uh, in terms of what's happening now with Indigenous people? And what does that look like for 100 years from now? Uh, so yeah, again, just further refining those kind of relationships with the shapes and forms, some of the more uh, ancestral forms of faces and ancestors, uh, kind of looking at this as like a portal as you're driving through, it's like a portal into like another dimension almost. And, and that's sort of why I think that there's such a power in working in, in public art in and transforming people's perspectives around it. Because as you start to live with these more uh, and develop relationships with them on a daily basis, so does your relationship with uh, your understanding of, the indi of indigenous people on the land. Kind of going into that idea of indigenous futurisms really kind of I, I love that idea of like how um afrofuturisms and the relationship like for example with marvel and how uh, uh black people were taking full kind of control over their own narrative it was really fascinating and inspiring for me to see so for me i'm such a fan of <laughs> of uh uh, sci-fi and this idea that these things that these are oval shapes right these are inspired by oval shapes coming from Salish uh, design that they are kind of like these almost alien like ships that are placed here so the idea of like indigenous people coming uh, <laughs> coming back and and uh, reclaiming our land in in ways that is um, symbolic of uh, of another alternate uh i guess parallel universe you could say and and it's so interesting to think about like how those forms like they they could look alien and alien out of this plant from the not from this planet but at the same time be so deeply rooted in in that um again that visual language of crescents and trigons and circles and just experimenting with different ideas of how these metals and materials come together this is i was using Again, going back to the idea of the land, I took all these different uh, elevation planes and kind of placed them around these oval shapes to kind of give like this really unique and uh, beautiful and abstract um, sort of way of playing with the light and the, the different dimensions of, of the sculpture. And I found that there was like a lot of similarities when I took those planes and surfaces of and those elevations to make up these, I found that they almost sort of resembled, if you look back, a lot of these Salish shapes that were moving around it. So again, that relationship between indigenous art and the land. So that's what that's why I kind of chose this one kind of leading up to that, because this is this artwork here titled Miowitz, which is uh, carved by water, is essentially this this building here is the uh, New Canada Games Pool in New Westminster, uh, and this building is being uh, was built on top of um, the Glenbrook Ravine. Uh, so if you look at some aerial shots of 
of the ravine, you can see that there's sort of this like S shape that kind of moves down. And that's of course, like what water does, it kind of carves away in these like really fluid uh, S shape like patterns, wherever there's like a resistance in, in, um, in material or rock, it kind of moves away, it finds its own path. And again, thinking about how those organic shapes come out of nature, this is just like that, that's that starting point. The conversation is that this sculpture is like resembling that, that form that came out of the land. So again, you see, right, this is a big trigon kind of going through the middle of it. As I was walking through the ravine, there was like this massive trigon as I was walking through it. So repeating patterns um, happening wherever, you know, if you, if you're observant enough, you can, you can, and slow down, you can see those, those relationships. And you look at this, um, it's interesting too, because that's kind of how they designed the building as well, thinking like that. But um, the, the stainless steel here in reflection kind of resembling that idea of water, like a water surface, it's reflective. Um, and it's kind of reflecting the surrounding nature back, back at, out into the open there. Again, that I, this is another piece that was inspired by the land. This is kind of closer to Port Moody. Uh, this one's uh, titled Hewakam, which means uh, blue, mussel sh blue mussel shell. Uh, and I took that idea again that, the, that this is sitting near a location in Port Moody where there used to be a lot of shell life. Um, so this piece responding to that history you know, there's no more shell life that actually lives there because the amount of traffic that's going through the Burrard Inlet, through whether that's freighters or, um, you know, boats driving up and down, there's just no, there's not as much uh, opportunity for life to exist. But this was like a place where a lot of our ancestors would go to gather, um, as they would say, if the, when the tide goes out, the dinner, <laughs> the dinner table is set. So it was it's just another one of those pieces that's responding to that history. And uh, I sort of separated these pieces so that when it was more interactive that people could walk through and engage with these pieces, um, sort of in, in reflection again of the viewer and the sculpture. So it becomes more interactive and talks about, again, their relationship to those pieces. Uh, and if you can tell, you can tell here, uh, again, use of the circles, the trigons, and crescents. Um, been I've been really trying to focus on really just using those elements to kind of guide your eye through through a, a composition. And in this case, I really wanted to outline the design of um, our oceanic canoes. Uh, and this piece is actually right out on the waterfront. That's going to be going out right out on the waterfront um, uh, of uh, next, it used to be called Nexon Beach, but it's now called Buckwest Feather Park in Squamish. Um, we have this old story of, of uh, the Great Flood. About 10,000 years ago, there was a Great Flood. And all of our canoes, we had to link all of our canoes into a raft because uh, it flooded out all of our vi villages. So we have this story of, of, uh, of our, all, all of our canoes. And what I find that's beautiful if you're looking from a certain vantage point on the ocean you can see Inchikite the mountain in which where we all had to go up because that's how high the water was so again that response of the sculpture to um the viewer the land and the sky and in, in that sense <clears throat> you can't see it in here because I, I didn't represent it here but when it's complete it will be 2023 20, uh, and thinking again through the, a lot of our, our works here uh, is the house post. And I wanted to represent that in a, like a contemporary, uh, material, uh, more of a material that could also last in the elements, which is just like a stainless steel and a, a, and a dyed aluminum, which is again, kind of is a nod to the tradition of wood carving where it's this taking away of material, but also the adding of material. Um, uh, so 
you know, it's like a kind of like a relief carving that you would do on a house post, but just in this case, it was, it would be done with like machined uh, metal. Uh, and in response, this, this piece is titled All My Relations, uh, because we're having here all these weaving patterns and uh, the uh, tree here, where we're kind of representing sort of that cycle of life uh, and, and also talking about how we need to respect the land, never take more than what we need so that the next seven generations can have what we have. And again, going back to uh, these kind of more contemporary looking shapes existing uh, as their own pieces, um, the crescent, uh, the circle and the trigon. And really, again, looking at these pieces of boat, I'm really trying to consider how it can be interactive. So it's like reflective of not just something that you look at, but something that you engage with and walk through. And again, going back to that idea that you're developing over time, this relationship with these forms and shapes and gaining new understandings. So strategically, I've kind of chosen areas that are high polish in, in uh, like a mirror finish so that when the viewer walks past it, it's almost sort of reflecting their own image back at them, giving them that idea that it's something that is not just reflective of itself as an object, but reflective of you living here on this land as well. And then I just wanted to touch in on some of the collaborations with my partner, Lauren Brevner. Um, a lot of the uh, mural paintings that you might have seen in the city are done by both of us. Uh, and, cert and again, thinking through those shapes. Um, but well, I think that a lot of our work combined is really about reconciliation, that we are working together, uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, uh, uh, mixing in both of our identities into our work and sort of the importance of that and like what that's doing uh, on a daily basis as a piece that exists. And this is like right in the financial district between all of the big banks. And, you know, it's important that we have these types of works in these, lo in these locations so that, you know, it's not just uh, the artists that are doing the work, it's, it's everyone. And and you're learning learning more as you start to live with this more and uh, again develop those relationships over time and understandings. So here is a button. We're kind of representing the button uh, button blanket with all these weaving patterns that would have been more used in um, uh, weaving cedar baskets, for example. So we've just taken those examples of those. Uh, those design patterns and put them into the mural. And um, this one was commissioned for the Vancouver Art Gallery. I don't know if everybody got a chance to see this one, but it was taking up the whole wall of their biggest room in the, in the building, uh, which was, I think, 30 feet by 27 feet, something like that. Or, yeah, I think maybe 40 feet by 27 feet. But again, thinking through that idea of cross collaboration with Indigenous and non Indigenous, Lauren being um, uh, part Japanese and Trinidadian, really trying to bring in her culture as well. And, and that's sort of what we've been touching on is that idea of reconciliation that we're working together and the amazing things that can come out of that when people work together. Again, another cross collaboration. This one's uh, Granville Island. Uh, if anybody's got a chance to see that, it's underneath the Chain and Forge building, uh, which is just across from, I don't know how else to describe where, I'll, how, it's, there's two big pillars done by uh, Deborah Sparrow outside that are uh, Musqueam uh, weaving patterns. And that brings us, bring, brings me to the mural that uh, we were working at Griffin Art Projects while we were there. So we were commissioned by the SOS Village um, two years ago, actually, and it because of COVID, it took us a while to to kind of finally get to it. But uh, we we uh, wanted to really work on this at the Griffin Art Projects while we were doing our artist in residence there. And again, we were really wanting to represent the children in this piece as well as 
those iconic Salish shapes and bringing more light to that conversation. Um, so just some more pictures of it developing over time. And that's the final image, but it's not, this is the digital image. We don't have, cause it's still at SOS Village and we're waiting cause we're actually collaborating with the kids. So they're putting their hands in these locations of the mural painting so that it's like that collaboration with the kids at the SOS Village. Um, and again, we wanted to work with them because we want, because there is a very large Indigenous population there of children that I feel like it'd be very important for them to see their culture and be proud of that. And um, yeah. And that sort of kind of concludes my presentation. Um, yeah. Did you want to maybe open it up to questions and a discussion? Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much for your incredible presentation, James. It's always an honor to hear you talk. And uh, yeah, we'll be opening the floor for questions now. As I said, if you want to say your question out loud, you just need to raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Or you can also type it and we will read it out loud. Uh, but while that happens, while you folks formulate your questions, Emmett, Emmett has a question. <laughs> yeah, um, the first thing that I'll uh, bring up here is, uh, could you speak a little bit about the impact your art and the art of other uh, contemporary Salish artists, um, how it will impact the generations to come and specifically how it uh, um, affects uh, recognition of Salish art? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think it's, we're, it's super important that we're recognizing it right now, especially since, um, you know, a lot of our city is, is booming right now in terms of like uh, new places, new works going up. And so as that is also developing, we need to kind of consider those works being integrated with that at the same time, because um, those will just be missed opportunities if we don't. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, to more answer your question about, I guess, how it can change uh, people's perspectives over time is that I think, yeah, you have to, you kind of live with this uh, idea that we, or you're growing with it as well. You know, it's it takes a while to kind of understand the fundamentals of the design language, um, but also develop the understanding of just uh, what the artists are trying to say when they're making these pieces. So yeah, actually, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question but because it is quite a big one, but uh, yeah, I, I think that as every generation comes, they're gonna learn from, from the last one, right? Like I see the young kids today and every, every kid, child I see running around was wearing a red, uh, orange shirt, um, which like really warmed my heart, but it, that was just sort of proof to me that the work that we're doing is like really um, influencing these kid, kids to like have this deeper understanding of the, the, the uh, land that they're living on and it kind of over time will also change when they're grown up it'll change as well because their their understanding has has uh been changed thank you so much uh we have three questions uh from well four questions now or more than four questions um from our audience so uh we'll try to get to all of them uh first up we have Allison Hall asking do you approach each collaboration with Lauren differently or how has the collaboration process evolved over time yeah that's a really good question um yeah it was in the beginning uh when I started working with Lauren it was it it was like we were learning each other's uh, ways of creating like artistically as well as just where we come from uh, more from like, like our identities and trying to figure our way through that. I think the thing that we always relied upon is that we were mixed, that we had these, this mixed identity of like, cause I'm indigenous and uh, Scottish and German and she's Trinidadian Japanese and Scottish. So, and uh, I think that's one thing that we always sort of relied on to kind of fuel our passion behind our work 
is that we always kind of were frustrated with how how we were always being kind of pigeonholed into one or, or one thing or the other and all we w- really wanted people to do was just love our work for what it is um so that's kind of like how we've worked through it together is uh yeah just always relying on that um but also just the passion and the love for making art and uh the healing that that has done for us individually too um so yeah it's just a process and we work through that together awesome um uh next up we have uh Rachel Graf. Uh, she says, wonderful presentation. She would like to show your sh- slideshow for students, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. I can uh, I can send that afterwards. Yeah, and, uh, actually, yeah, Sorry, maybe, yeah, maybe what we can do is if there are more folks interested in showing this slideshow, they can email me and Harry, I can email them back with the presentation that you sent. Is that okay? And uh, one other thing to note is that uh, this will be this presentation will be going up on our uh, YouTube channel as well to be accessed at a later date. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Uh, uh, Natalie Gorin asks, "Can you tell us a little bit more about the three main shapes and their meanings?" Um, yeah, that's a good question. I have asked elders about the shapes. Um, but uh, nobody's ever really been able to give me like a like a solid answer on where it came from, how they came to be, uh, and that's sort of where my sort of passion in in exploring these forms on my own has been kind of developed over time. Is that it's this is my way of kind of trying to understand understand them myself. Um, yeah, a lot of our we almost lost uh, everything. Uh, all of our knowledge keepers, there was only 13 uh, fluid speakers left in the Squamish Nation at one point. Um, so, you know, that just gives you an idea to like how close it was to almost uh, being completely gone. So a lot of the work that uh, our people have been doing is trying to reclaim that. Um, so, and and that's sort of just my way of kind of exploring that is uh, doing it in my own way. Thank you very much. Um, next up, uh, Chris Wong says, uh, wow, that's incredible work, James. How would you avoid the equivalent of writer's block when you are thinking about new works of art? Do you use a scrapbook with new ideas? Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I always go through um, writer's blocks for sure. And the way I usually deal with that is actually just going and walking and going, being a part of the land. Um, I've gone up Squamish and gone through, gone for hikes, let the oxygen of the trees kind of help help my clear my mind. Um, and it's really always being the land that has helped helped me through that because. Uh, there's so many beautiful formations and the rocks that are made, the organic organic shapes that just, you know, the the greatest sculptor sculptor of all time is Mother Nature. If you look close enough, you can see some beautifully amazing carvings in the rock. And and it's sort of those abstract forms that really help me. If I'm if I can't think of something, it's almost sort of like my I'm working through my ancestors trying to find those ideas and then they just come to me. So that's how I normally deal with writer's block. It doesn't always work though. Sometimes it takes more time. I think that's a really beautiful answer. (laughs) Thank you. We have a question by an anonymous attendee who asks, you mentioned about not working on totem poles. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah. um, So, you know, I, uh, in my dad's generation, he, um, he was carving total totem poles and and uh, but that that's why I was mentioning that my grandmother uh, coming from Kokwakiwak in Alert Bay, we did totem poles on that side. Um, but uh, more, but we didn't actually do totem poles in uh, in Salish territories. It was house posts that we were uh, creating. So part of um, part of what I've been trying to 
to do more of is mainly only focus in Salish art so that we understand those histories. Uh, because, you know, the more, I, I don't think we should be raising more totem poles because that's kind of a false narrative that we're continuing on. Um, is, you know, it, it's uh, it's on this territory. Yeah, we're on Salish territory, so we should be paying more attention to Salish art. Uh, so that's part of the reason that I stopped doing it. Because um, even though I I can on my from my grandmother's side, I I, I live in uh, I work on Salish land, so I'm trying to uh, mainly only focus on doing Salish Salish work. So yeah. There were no totem poles here, just so everyone knows. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Natalie Gorn asks, uh, how did you start working with light as a material? Was light an important element in Salish art history? Um, I loved working in light mainly because uh, when I was working, when I was starting to work more in metal um, and piercing through metal designs, I really wanted a way of contrasting like the positive and negative shapes. And it was really interesting for me to, when I was designing metal um, house posts that I was trying to think about how the light was playing through all those different shapes. Uh, so I really wanted to integrate that in into my works. Also, it was at a time when I knew that um, red and yellow cedar was not gonna be as readily available to us to carve. So I was trying to, kind of make uh, moves to using different materials. Um, and also thinking about like, again, going back to the idea of indigenous futurisms, how, how our work is changing and evolving. Um, historically speaking, we didn't use it, of course, but you know, it's no different for me to use it today as it would be for anybody else. So um, uh, part of what I like to see through this is is how it can be integrated into um, uh, new new developments that are happening, so that we can kind of uh, collaborate towards uh, making these contemporary works. And uh, yeah, nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the next question we have is from Amber Lee Perking, uh, who asks, well, first she says, thank you so much, James, for sharing today. Your artwork is incredibly inspiring. I am an art teacher and Emily Carr University alumni. I'm curious, how have your elders responded to, re to your reimagining of traditional Salish designs and artwork? Also, how did the SOS mural project come about and what has your interaction been like with the children youth there? Yeah, um, I guess the first question would be just how my elders responded to it. Uh, the one person I'm always trying to get uh, a positive uh, feedback from is my grandma Gwen. Uh, and she's always been proud of what I've been doing. And um, uh, I think that, you know, although I have been creating uh, works that are not maybe may may be necessarily agreed upon by all uh, traditional thinkers in my community. I think it's important that we um, are adapting to, uh, you know, contemporary uh, ways of making things because, you know, um, we're not stuck in the past. And, uh, you know, it, that's been part of actually part of my frustrations with society at large is that uh, they've always had a way of romanticizing us. Um, so uh, I think that uh, as we create more works like this, um, so do people's uh, perspectives change. So at, at the same time that I, I might not get all of the same sort of feedback from everybody the same way that I might want to, I think that this is really the way to go. Um, and then what was the other part of the question? It was, I can't read those questions, so. Uh, one second, I'll find it again. Um, so how did the SOS mural project come about and what was your interaction between, uh, with the uh, children and youth there? How was that like? Uh, so they reached out to uh, Lauren and I 
because they had seen one of our murals uh, downtown and they really thought it would be a, a fun uh, collaboration with us as the artists and working with the kids kind of coming up with ideas around how uh, we should make a mural for them so that they can like have this piece of work that they live with and uh, originally we talked about doing it on the side of the building but then they didn't know how long they were going to have the building so we ended up doing a canvas um, so uh, yeah and part of our engagement with the kids was to go there and kind of work with them get to know them uh, get some of their ideas and uh, bring some of their their ideas into the into the artwork so a lot of this is very collaborative a very collaborative work and you can kind of tell this isn't really the style that we normally do so it was um yeah it was an interesting process Thanks. awesome thank, thank you very you. much mm -hmm. um we have a question from an anonymous uh, attendee um can you talk a bit more about your interest in sci-fi and how you imagine this influencing future works and ideas or possible collaborations with Afrofuture artists? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just something that fascinates me because um, wh whenever I think about like this idea of the of uh, like indigenous people coming and reclaiming our land with these sculptures, it's always like just kind of interesting to think about like what if this was all run by indigenous people in these positions where we could control the narrative and uh what would our city look like what would society look like it's just uh i almost kind of envision these sculptures as being part of that conversation and with a lot of these sculptures so um it just really excites me to think about that and um yeah just seriously being inspired by afrofuturism like that going back to that whole thing with with uh, marvel and and uh, Black Panther back, I remember watching that when it was first came out being like really stoked on just like how they had complete control over that narrative. It's like, what what would that look like if indigenous people could do that same thing with a Marvel movie? It's like, it's important because these are all parts of our society that our young people are gonna watch this and they're gonna grow up with this and feel proud, proud of that. So, and yeah, cause I grew up, I was lucky to have somebody like my dad to feel proud about my cult, my culture. But if I didn't, then I could understand how difficult that might be, you know? So, yeah, I don't know if that answers all the questions, but. <laughs> no, this is great. Thank you, James. Uh, we have a question by Lee Lover who asks, uh, looking back, how would you approach igniting art outside what might be taught in a middle school setting? Uh, sorry, could you uh, read the question again? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so how will you approach igniting art outside what might be taught in a middle school setting? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I, I would just start to show more contemporary artists uh, and indigenous artists um, and uh, show like the thinking behind like, you know, people like myself or uh, other people in my community, like Casey Hall has been doing some pretty cool stuff. And, uh, you know, because we're all we're all people who have been really involved in modern society and trying to change perspectives around um, our culture and art, but doing it in a respectful way. And, uh, and I think, yeah, if we can kind of lean towards that direction, it would be uh, I think a really interesting and meaningful way to engage your students about what's happening now and how it's changing. So, and, but yeah, of course, I know um, teaching them the more historical stuff that has happened as well to kind of bring them there to that part of the conversation. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just looking at some of our questions. Um, so this is a question from an uh, anonymous attendee uh, that says, uh, first of all, just thank you so much. Great talk. Very interesting to learn about the different Salish art elements. As a contemporary artist, would you create new elements to add to the overall Salish design language? Hmm, that's a good question. It's, 
I, I could maybe see myself doing that many years down the road, but for now it's because we're so far behind, like we need to train a lot of, of people to understand the main elements first uh, before I start confusing it with other things. Uh, I, I, will, I can see myself doing it down the road, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done before I start doing that. Thank you, James. Uh, we have a question also by an anonymous attendee, and they ask, uh, do you feel a pressure to make work that is widely understood as well as widely appreciated? For instance, how do you respond to those who like your work so solely for its aesthetic, for example? Yeah, i um, not sure if I fully understand the question. So you're saying, or I'm, ju I'm just actually trying to find all the questions here too, so I can read them yeah. as you're I going. can copy paste it in the chat if you want. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. And I sent it to you. Okay. Um. Yeah, I guess I I wonder what you mean by pressure, because um, yeah, there is. I mean, there's always going to be a pressure from both sides. Uh, what what I was talking about earlier about needing to kind of push the boundaries and change things a little bit, but also being respectful. There, that's that's one sort of pressure that I have. Um, but ultimately, I think that yeah, it needs to go in a direction that that is just like all art is always pushing the boundaries. It's, it's, it's changing the way we think of and respond to not only just historical narratives, but ones that are happening in our time and era today and how it's going to change uh, people's thinking. So uh, I'm not sure how else to respond. If, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Lee Jocko, which is, what does truth and reconciliation uh, day mean to you in your work? Yeah, uh, for me, truth and reconciliation day, well, I mean, we as Indigenous people have nothing to reconcile for. It's, you know, this is should be my day off, technically. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And that's why I'm also just very appreciative of the amount of people that have showed up to the talk today to learn uh, and just listen to what I had to say about, you know, my work. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's just a day to kind of also educate people, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, an, it's a ongoing, I think will be a never ending uh, stream of, of uh, work for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Actually, to kind of, uh, I don't know, expand upon that question a little bit, how do you see uh, truth and reconciliation uh, affecting your work in a more general sense, uh, regardless of just today or not? Well, I can see that it really, um, it definitely gives more light to the situation and how important it is that we uh, are constantly evolving together because um, it's not just one-sided it's like we have to work together in order to you know make this a positive outcome so uh, I always yeah I, I see that, that it is very positive for the fact that it brings people together and it's a time to like reflect and uh, be respectful and listen and yeah Okay, we have a question by uh, Erin, and um, I also share it to you, James, uh, via the chat, um, and I'll read it out loud. So they ask, when you're coming up with an idea for an art piece, do you share it with family and friends, or do you like to only show the finished piece? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I actually mainly share it with Lauren first. <laughs> um, and yeah, sometimes my dad, but um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I don't actually end up showing people. So, um, and that's just part of my way of working through um, all the kinks and stuff. It's like, I know there are some things that, like, unless I'm like really proud of, of it and showing people, I'm not going to show it to the public. So 
Um, but a lot of my ideas are also like, because I work in the public realm, it's like, they are very thought through pe every piece is responding to the land. It's responding to the location. The aesthetic is, it's also the aesthetic is responding to the surrounding aesthetic. So a lot of thought goes into those pieces. And sometimes I don't really have time to do my own personal stuff as much. So uh, as in personal, as in like, you know, I will just make a painting versus I'm doing it with like a, a like a big team of people. Um, so yeah, there are two different, very different ways of working. <clears throat> Definitely. Um, so uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee, which is, uh, uh, what has been your most uh, joyful experience as an artist to date? My joyful, oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought it was kind of cute, so. <laughs> my uh, most joyful, hmm. I don't know, I really have to think about that one. <laughs> um, I would have to say, well, I mean, I had many. Uh, but every time I guess I've uh, worked with my dad on projects, just the um, there's been some occasions where I've worked with uh, people where who we've actually changed their perspectives on uh, Salish people abroad, like because we used to do work in the UK. So, um, yeah, uh, there was a joyful moment uh, there in the UK where there was we an old lady who came up to us who at first seemed like she was going to be very racist. <laughs> and then uh, she just loved us as human beings and came by every day to because uh, she just loved what we were doing. And uh, that's maybe one of them. <laughs> it's hard. There's a lot. though, So it's kind of hard to pick. <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question by Lee Lofer, and they ask, looking back, what things or ideas will you change from your experience in the school system? Hmm, that's a really good question. Uh, depends on which school system we're talking about, because it was hard for every single one of them, for me, from elementary to high school to even Emily Carr. Um, well, I know that they're doing a lot of different things in elementary and high schools now compared to when I was a younger child. So uh, I can't really speak to that now because I don't know what they're doing in schools different than they are, than I when I was. But um, I could probably speak more to my experience at Emily Carr that uh, it was really difficult for me to make work while I was there, mainly because I, I always felt like I was educating people and nobody was really responding to my work in a way that I wanted to wanted them to respond and you know they would look at my work as decorative or they just people were just uneducated again so you know I don't blame them these are students coming from all over all parts of the world but you know it was clear to me that the that the institution hadn't set up um uh like safe spaces for a lot of these indigenous kids that were going through because it's tough you know you're you're getting criticized for your work uh, and that's every ounce of yourself. So putting yourself out there is already very difficult. Um, but uh, I know that they've kind of, you know, they could fix a lot of those things by bringing in more Indigenous faculty who might be a little more educated in that. Um, yeah, but that in itself is a big, big problem too. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I that's one of the things I would change if, it, if for an institution like, uh, Emily Carr would be to bring in more Indigenous faculty and, and professors. How do you envision, this is a question for me, uh, from me, uh, how do you envision an Indigenous education? Um, that's a really good question and it's a really hard one to answer because I think one of our biggest hiccups right now is that um, you need to have a master's in in order to train uh, or teach uh, at certain institutions. And that's a big barrier for a lot of uh, indi indigenous um, faculty or professors. And um, I think that that's like a very rooted question in our government that we need to 
change a lot of these policies for for um, indigenous people who have like a very extensive have very extensive knowledge in in this practice but might might not necessarily be in a position to take like a an actual role as a as a trained um uh teacher so and that's i think that's one of our biggest problems there it's it's part of a a bigger problem that it's really hard to answer but if that wasn't the problem i would see more i would see more um salish people in for example, if it was Salish art we were teaching, there would be Salish people teaching those positions. Um, and yeah, just because I know that for a fact they would be more res like responsive to uh, to their own culture as if somebody wasn't from their culture, you know? So yeah, very deep question for sure too. It's, yeah. Thank yeah, you. definitely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, actually kind of as a bit of an extension of that, we do have a question here from an anonymous attendee who is, it, it, I think it's a bit of a, uh, of a difficult question as well. And I'm gonna condense this a little bit, um, but do you, how do, how do you feel about uh, Coast Salish art elements being used by non-Coast Salish artists or um, especially if it is in an educational sense? Uh, uh, how would you approach that? Um, I would approach it two different ways. If um... You know, if if it was for education purposes, I would I would give permission to use my work, my designs, um, to the teacher, mainly because I would want there to be more accessible visuals for for students to kind of learn and digest. And uh, so I wouldn't expect that that it would have to be an indigenous teacher for that. But that being said if they are doing that, that they do take a little bit of a formal training towards uh, learning or maybe learning a little bit more of the aesthetic and um, uh, the design language so that they're not uh, accidentally teaching the wrong thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so there there is that. But if somebody else was using the artwork um, for their own gain, then that would be appropriation. So a uh, that would not be acceptable, uh, mainly because yeah, you would be taking away opportunities from uh, indigenous um, indigenous people, and uh, yeah, it's just wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, and I know that's a that's a bit of a tough question. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, And maybe building on what you were uh, answering, uh, this is a question that Emmett and I drafted. Uh, so how do you see the relationship between minimalism and Salish design? Minimalism? Yep. Um, I, uh, how do I see the contrast between them? Well, I, I, I really look at because Salish art is actually not very minimalist in a way where it's like it's actually can be very busy at times in the design aesthetic. Um, with the shapes is so that people can start to understand the shapes more by seeing them uh, by, by living amongst them and yeah developing that relationship over time because it's one thing for me who's someone who's been looking at these shapes my whole life I understand them inside and out but you know for somebody else who might not have been here as long or is wanting to learn more it I think it kind of takes that time to like oh ending of the forms and the shapes and um yeah so that's why I really chose for minimalists awesome thank you uh, we have a question from Lori Phillips, uh, which is if you, you oh sorry. Yeah, you, I think we lost uh, James. Oh no, I yeah. uh, I didn't even see that. I was looking at the questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, what should we do here? Yeah, we'll just give it a second for them to come back. Okay. It's yeah, his connection cut out for a second there for me, but he came back and 
Yeah, there. Um, the screen froze for a second, and then we lost them. So hopefully they'll they'll be able to come back through the link. I think. Okay. Hi, James again. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> That's okay. okay. So happy you're back. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Well, I guess we'll get right back, right back to it. Um, we had a, a question from Lori Phillips, which is, uh, if you were free to pick any location to install a piece of your work, uh, where would that be? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, I guess, like, just off the top of my head, uh, I'd probably say somewhere in, like, a very high traffic area in Vancouver, um, just because of the amount of eyes, like, uh, that would see it like on Granville in Georgia, for example, I could see a very prominent piece existing there. Um, that's just sort of my first thought. Uh, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I'll think about that one some more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> like, yeah, like anyway. Um, okay, well, in that case, um... What do you think about the future of Salish carvings? Do you see it shifting more and more towards using a 3D program like you have shown us today? Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things about being able to kind of adapt and use technology is that, you know, we don't have to be limited to working in traditional materials all the time, although it's something I love and enjoy doing. Um, I always love to work in different materials and mediums and programs. It's just, uh, uh, it helps me kind of envision what it is I'm doing. And my hope is that like one day it's gonna start to inspire and change, uh, you know, younger indigenous kids and students growing up that they can also do that and not feel like they have to be, um, you know, working in that material. Although I think it is important that we like stay true to those traditions in a lot of regards. Um, we all, you know, we also can like move between uh, mediums. So you don't have to, uh, I know that's sort of the pressures from a lot of different uh, situations or elders that might say we need to almost like, you got to keep speaking the language because we can't lose our language. So, um, but uh, that's why I choose to work in both cedar carvings and programs because I'm still staying uh, true to like those traditions in some regard so yeah thank you so much uh, we have a question here and maybe we'll, we'll, we will start to wrap up now so folks send your your last questions now uh, this is a question by L they ask are your pieces accompanied by informative flags to educate the viewer and I will top the question by asking, like, how will you hope the viewer will get educated by seeing your art? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the artworks that I've um, actually won bids on recently, I'm doing uh, films for them as like documentaries for the, the process, the idea and the installation. And every piece that goes up is going to have like a little plaque. Uh, that is like a QR code attached so that when people go up, they can scan it with their phone and it'll take them to the website where they can watch the video. Mm -hmm. And and also if not every project will have a documentary, but if it doesn't, then it will have like a description of, of that idea and concept. So yeah. Awesome. Um, one of the questions that we have here is uh, what uh, young indigenous artists are you following? I kind of want to uh, add to that question, uh, which, uh, aside from your father, what Indigenous artists have uh, inspired you? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was mentioning earlier, Casey Hall was uh, definitely one of, I really love his work. Um, and, you know, there, I'll speak more towards some of the artists that uh, inspired me earlier on. Um, Sonia Sue was definitely one of the artists where he was kind of changing uh, a lot of people's, he was like using a lot of humor for his work to kind of engage different conversations that were hard to talk about conversations. Um, as well as Raymond Boisjoli, who is one of my instructors at Emily Carr. Um, 
and Michelle Sound also is uh she's doing like some really cool uh designs with drums like fur drums and uh attaching all kinds of different materials onto them uh kind of put me on the spot now I don't know <laughs> uh yeah uh oh also yeah Sean Hunt was definitely one of my uh favorite uh artists while, while I was going to school I was uh always sort of like oh yeah I want to be like you have a career like Sean one day or you know so there's yeah um yeah and I know that there's some more younger artists that are coming up that uh yeah we gotta keep an eye on as well there's some uh I'll mention a couple Salish artists there's um Luke Marston as well who's been in uh his work is just phenomenal very very uh you can tell he has trained in Salish art for a while a long time um and uh Aaron Nelson Moody has been one of my mentors uh and he he more works in like repose and and metal work right now but he has done wood carvings as well so yeah yeah and finally going back to your last piece uh for SOS Village um we have a question by an anonymous attendee who uh says it appears tradition of Salish art explores the composition of shapes together to create form and expression your recent work seems to explore the engagement and meaning of the individual shape elements can you comment or expand on your exploration in this yeah um so yeah, like I was saying before, I was talking about those works as uh, uh, an ongoing series of uh, series I'm calling poetry of language, where um, these that we didn't have a written language. So I'm really looking at that idea that these forms were our written language, uh, in a way that they're just sort of like a lexicon or like an alphabet of this is sort of our, our alphabet, and really sort of deconstructing them and making them in their individual forms to kind of be have a conversation with each other like sort of like they're in a dance with each other that they're um yeah like that these ideas that you know going back to the idea that our ancestors were observers of the land of the of nature so like li quite literally these designs are coming out of the land uh so that's sort of what I'm thinking through when these pieces go up is that that um people can reflect on that idea when when they when they walk through the pieces Thank you. I think that's a wonderful way to uh, wrap up your talk. Thank you so much for, for your time and for uh, your patience answering all our questions today. And for folks who join us today, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you at our next event on Sunday for Curators Conversation, a Montreal Vancouver curator talk online around the work of Stan Douglas. It is worth noting that this talk was originally planned to be in person, but since has shifted to be online. To register, uh, I can share the link with everyone in the chat. Um, you can register there. Also a reminder that our gallery at Briefing Our Projects has an exhibition, Stan Douglas, Allegories of the Present. We are open Friday through Sunday, noon to 5 p.m. You can find out more by, uh, about Briefing by subscribing to our newsletter at the bottom of our website. Thank you so much, everyone, again, and I hope you have uh, a good day. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, James. Bye. Bye.